Well, Keith, welcome to the World Travel Market. Thank you for being with us today by, by video. We know you can't be here in person because uh, when we're showing the video, you'll be actually elsewhere heading for Madrid. So uh, uh, we appreciate your time today. I'd just like to start off by asking you uh, how you found it in the last few months since you became CEO, because, of course, you're not new to British Airways, but you took the CEO hot seat uh, less than a year ago, I think. Uh, how has that been and how does it compare with your previous role as CFO? Yeah, I'm firstly, sorry I can't be with you today. I'm the, the reason is I'm actually going down for an investor day. Uh, in terms of the year, uh, I've been in post, I think, almost a year now. Um, it's been an eventful year. All years within the industry are eventful, and this one's no exception. Um, a CEO, in, in many ways, it's not that much different from my role at CFO. I, I'd say it's more that I feel like I'm the captain of the team today, but it's still a team. Uh, I've got a team of 11 people. Uh, some of them are new players on the pitch, some of them are old, experienced players on the pitch, but it makes a good team. One of the problems which was still rumbling on when you, when you uh, came into the CEO role was, of course, a very public uh, cabin crew dispute which had uh, uh, affected BA for uh, well over a year, 18 months. That's now been resolved, uh, at least in public terms. I, is it really all done and dusted? Are, are you now able to move forward from that quite difficult time? Yeah, I think it is. If I look at you know, what's happened over the last several years at, at BA, um, you know, we, we've had a lot of uh, reconstruction to make within the company to respond to what's been happening in the wider environment. And you know, the cabin crew dispute, as you said, was a, was a long dispute. I think it was ready for settlement when I came into my role. Um, it's now been settled. Um, we're you know, trying to move forward. We are moving forward in terms of the brand and pushing the brand forward. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on there. Uh, there's been a lot of change in the company. You know, and, and to my mind, you, know, you, you don't get the amount of change that we've made without some disruption along the way. So that was a big internal problem. But of course, the industry is known for facing almost a, a continuous series of uh, crises. Uh, what would you say uh, is the, the external backdrop that BA faces currently in terms of uh, global challenges? Yeah, I'd, I'd put it in sort of three buckets, really. There's a short-term issue, there's a medium-term issue, and then there's the longer term. If I look in the shorter term, if you look at the economic backdrop, the economic backdrop is obviously looking slower than it has, has been in the past. And against that, you've got a, a very high oil price uh, at the same time, which is different from where we were a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, we had good economic growth and a high oil price. The two together uh, weren't too much of a challenge. Uh, then we had the very slow economic backdrop, but at the same time, a very low oil price. So you know, we, we managed to, to sail through that. Today, you've got a combination of slowing economic growth and a high oil price. So that's going to make a short-term challenge for BA and for the industry. In the medium term, I think there's a lot more consolidation to happen within the industry, and that, and that will happen over time. And then the longer term for me is we look, look, need to look at our environmental footprint uh, and the things that we need to do there as an industry uh, to, to, you know, to satisfy the, the economic and, and environmental concerns at the same time. And, and how about some of the wider challenges which we've seen in the last uh, few years? I think if anybody had been planning ahead, you couldn't have uh, put on your list that there might be a volcanic eruption, a, a major earthquake in, in Japan, uh, the financial meltdown which we've seen since 2008 and the ongoing uh, Eurozone problems. Do you think the industry uh, is getting better at dealing with this type of thing? Because it isn't possible to forecast these type of events, but uh, they have a massive impact on business volumes and uh, financial performance for airlines. Yeah, I forget which British Prime Minister once said, events, my boy, events. But uh, I think events are always going to be there for, for our industry. And, and for me, part of it is, you know, is, is how quickly you recover from those events, uh, both in terms of you know, improving the, the performance of the airline, but similarly improving the performance for our customers. And, and, and we're working on both. So you know, there's a lot of work going on in terms of managing capacity and everything else for, for downturns. At the same time, there's a lot of work going on within BA as to how we best recover from events and best serve our customers through that. Now, another challenge that you face here in the UK is uh, government taxes on tickets for uh, air passenger duty and there are other similar taxes in other parts of Europe and indeed the world. Do you think governments have... Uh, overestimated the ability to, to put these type of taxes on, on aviation, on ticket prices, and uh, is there going to be any change to that you would see in the future, and what effect is it having on you and indeed on some markets you serve? Yeah, we've got 
you know, a mixture of global or attempted global taxes and UK taxes. And the UK is the most highly taxed aviation market now in the world. If I, if I break it between the two, if I look at APD first of all, which, which I think came in 1995 and has been around for some time, it's had some pretty significant hikes over the last couple of years. And that does have an effect on, on travel, particularly in non-premium travel. And what we've seen under the, the rules that exist in, in, under APD, that for some destinations they're disincentivised and other destinations are incentivised. So take for instance is that you know, we fly both to the Caribbean and to Florida. Um, there's a higher level of tax to the Caribbean than there is to Florida and we've adjusted our capacity to fly more to Florida than the Caribbean, really, because demand has dampened down in the Caribbean down to, to APD increases. So that's at the local level. Uh, uh, at, the, at the more international level, uh, as BA, we've always favoured emissions trading as a way of tackling our environmental footprint. Um, what we need to see, however, is a global solution to emissions trading, uh, not just a, an in, a European solution. So we're looking to support a, a global answer, and indeed that's where the industry is, and that's where I think uh, we need to get to. Do you think in, in that context we, we might see some difficulties next year when the European uh, ETS uh, scheme comes into place? We've seen a number of uh, countries are thre uh, threatening retaliatory action, and uh, are we going to see a kind of uh, airline trade war possibly evolving in the coming months? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, but what I would say, it, it, it is something that uh, I think is a danger for the European airline industry, certainly. You, know, you have seen threats of retaliatory action from China, from India, from the US, um, and that is bad for business. You know, it's bad for our business, and it's bad for global trade at the same time. So it's something that needs resolution uh, over the coming months. Now, looking at the actual shape of the airline industry, you touched on BA's own realignment or rebalancing between uh, long haul and, and short haul traffic. Is there a kind of a, a, a broader change in structure of the industry happening? I mean, are we seeing a realignment of, for example, long haul? We, we, we see the, the growth of carriers in the Gulf, for example, uh, Emirates, Etihad, Qatar. Uh, in the short haul market, uh, we have very strong low cost carriers in Europe, such as Ryanair and EasyJet, and indeed in other parts of the world. Is that something uh, of a polarization which is going to happen more, you think, in the future? Yeah, my, my job is to make us competitive in both those markets in terms of long haul and short haul markets. Markets. If, if I look at the short haul market in particular, uh, you have seen the growth of the, the low cost carriers. And I think in Europe today, you know, they, they come from a standing start and now have, what, 45, 50% of the market. The legacy carriers still have their share of the market, and it's the regional carriers that have been squeezed down the middle. Um, what I see is that there is a relevancy for the legacy carriers in the short haul market. Indeed, if I look at, at the last couple of months, is you know, we've won a number of awards as for short haul airline of the year in a, in a number of our sort of segments. So you know, in that market, we're doing well, but I not, can't be complacent there. Is we need to change we is where, where customer t tastes change over time, and we need to adapt to that. And in the long-haul market, the challenges of, uh, for example, these Middle Eastern carriers or, or indeed the, the premium Asian carriers, is that something that uh, you would say BA is uh, up to the fight and going to take the fight forward? Yeah, we've made a lot of changes over the last 10 years to, to better be able to uh, compete in those markets. What we need to do is to respond to that competition. You know, we're doing a lot of work at the moment with the brand. We've got new products coming out over the next 12, 18 months. We're doing a lot of work on, on innovation within the industry, and all that's coming together. You know, what I'm seeing at the moment is strong demand for, for British Airways and British Airways products. What I need to do is to ensure that that continues going forward. Now, we have seen mergers of some uh, major airline groups in, in recent years, both in, in the US and in Europe. And indeed, in, in the last year, British Airways is now part of a, a new grouping called IAG, or the full name International Consolidated Airline Group. Uh, many people in the audience may not understand that. Uh, can you explain what that means now in terms of what is this new grouping uh, and, and where does British Airways sit as a business within that? Yeah, so what, what, there was a merger with uh, Iberia last year, and as you said, is that was under the umbrella of IAG. Um, and IAG acts as a holding company of two operating companies. Uh, the one thing I'd, I'd 
sort of point out very, very quickly is if you look at those two operating companies, they've got very different brands. You've got a British Airways brand, you've got an Iberian brand, and the two will always remain independent of each other. And my, my role as uh, CEO of BA is to push forward the BA brand, and equally my counterpart in, in Iberia will push forward the I Iberian brand. But it isn't intended to bring the two together. We are two, two distinct brands, and we will remain two distinct brands. And IAG will hopefully add more operating companies to the portfolio over time. Has it meant any changes to your actual network in terms of uh, routes served or, or realignment between yourselves uh, and Iberia? Yeah, for, for British Airways, it brings a, a number of advantages. Um, in terms of, of network, um, it allows us to compete far better in South America than we were able to do previously. Now, that doesn't mean to say that all traffic would go through Madrid onto South America. It actually gives British Airways a better selling capability within South America, and that's encouraged us to add a route, say, to, to Buenos Aires. Uh, of equal importance in terms of consolidation within the industry. We've now got antitrust immunity with American, and that supports us in North America. Um, and an example there is, you know, we've recently reflying to uh, San Diego, and that's on the back of the greater selling c capability that American gives us in, in California. So those are just two examples, the way the industry is consolidating, which is of advantage to British Airways. It may be of advantage to British Airways, but uh, possibly some consumers and, again, people in the audience may wonder, is this going to be a, a bad thing from the point of view of the travelling public? If airlines start getting together, be it through mergers or, or, or joint ventures or, or alliances, is this not going to lead to a, a kind of a, a semi-monopolistic -monop situation in the marketplace and consumers will end up uh, being worse off than they are today? No, I think consumers have a great deal of choice today and will continue to have a great deal of choice in the future. I think it actually helps the consumer because if you take an example of, of British Airways flying to New York, um, previously we would set off at the same time or roughly the same time as flights from American. We can now work together to establish a schedule that flies on the hour for in the afternoon and in the evening, which is a better suit for the customer. And uh, one uh, question about your own future fleet plans, Keith. Uh, BA hasn't had a, a large renewal of its long-haul fleet for, for some years. Indeed, some of your 747s are, I think, maybe 20 years vintage in age. But you have got orders in for new generation aircraft, both with Airbus, the uh, A380 and Boeing 787 Dreamliner. When are they coming on stream? And what is that going to mean in terms of uh, your options for uh, route and network development? Mm -hmm and for the customer in terms of uh, flying experience? Yeah, I think we've, you know, we've got the aircraft coming in at a, a very good time. We've got 12 A380s and 24 787s, so you know, a combination of the two. The A380s will do some of the big trunk routes. The, the 787s will give us more flexibility to serve markets that we, we haven't served before. The other advantage of those aircraft is they're much more fuel efficient and noise efficient than, uh, than the older aircraft in the fleet. And they give us the capability to grow if the market's growing and retire 747s if the market is, is shrinking. So it, it gives us maximum flexibility, a better oil price consumption and uh, you know, a great service to the destinations we want to serve. You mentioned also earlier on about uh, emissions being a, a key issue for the industry and aviation certainly has been heavily targeted by governments, uh, not just with the emissions trading scheme, but uh, questions about short-haul air travel, uh, the, the industry's responsibility. Uh, is this something that British Airways takes seriously? Are there any specific things that you are doing to uh, improve your environmental credentials? Yes, yeah, as I said earlier, you know, for me, if I look out to the longer term, I think environment will play a greater part in, in the role of the industry and a greater part in the role that, that British Airways plays. And we need to be in the forefront of that. And there's a couple of things that, that we're doing is, one, we're working on uh, fuel efficiency within the airline, and we've got a number of initiatives uh, within that to improve our own footprint in the short term. We're also uh, investing in a, in a plant with a company that produces biojet, um, to put into our aircraft, and that will be better from the environmental viewpoint than we are today. So there's a number of initiatives that we have. Um, ultimately, you know, the change in aircraft will add to that. It will reduce our noise footprint, and that's a pattern I think we need to continue for the longer term, really as, a, as BA and as an industry.
Keith, we know you have a very busy agenda. We really appreciate that you've taken time out to speak with us uh, today for the world travel market. We wish you great success with your, your future work in the coming months and years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you.